Well, the Anvil Foundry has been put together. It's been cleaned and rinsed and passivated, and now I'm ready to brew. Hey folks, welcome to the Basement Brew House. I've never brewed down here before. It's not very well lit. It's not very big. Uh, the room is only about that wide. Uh, I can almost reach the, the sides. But it's brew day. Now because this is the first run through with the Anvil Foundry, I'm keeping things rather simple and making a smash. It's a single malt and a single hop, and I'm calling it an IPA. What I've got is 13 pounds of Maris Otter, and that's it. That should give me an original gravity of around 1060. And for the hop additions, I've got uh, three and a half ounces total. The first ounce and a half goes at 60 minutes, and then the other two ounces at five minutes remaining in the boil. I'm hoping that'll give me a, a nice medium bitterness with a little uh, kick and aroma and uh, flavor at the end. Now one of the things that sold me on the Anvil Foundry was the delay timer. I filled my foundry up with my strike water volume last night and then before going to bed I set the timer so that the heating element would come on and it would start heating the strike water about an hour or so before I planned on waking up. Uh, when I got up this morning, brewed my coffee, came downstairs, the strike temperature was at 163, right where I wanted it. So in goes 13 pounds of Maris Otter. And I'm doing this just a little bit at a time. Being that it's a brand new system, I'm not sure exactly if there's any difference between this and my big three vessel brew rig out in the garage. Out there I would just dump everything in at once because it's a, it's a big wide mash tun. This is narrow and tall so there may be no difference at all. But I'll just have to get a feel for it and learn as I go. That's why you want to take care when you dough in to break up those clumps because they may look wet but inside they're dry and that is grain that would not be in contact with the, the mash water and would not get uh, converted. There, I think I've got them all. Now what I want to do is change the set temperature to my desired mash temperature. Otherwise, uh, the unit here is going to try to keep uh, heating this up to 163. So I want to press the minus button. 
and take this down to 152. And it'll stop blinking when it's set. There we go. And now, I don't know what's going to happen. I haven't done this before. It's quite possible that I probably should have set that to 152 as I was doing in or just before. But I didn't. And it is what it is. And we'll just see what happens. Again, this is the very first time. And mistakes will be made. All right, so I need to lose some temperature. I'm not going to put the lid on just yet. I'm going to walk away now and let this sit for 10 or 15 minutes and uh, see if my uh, temperature settles down to 152, which is my desired mash temperature. All right, it's been about a half an hour since I doughed in and I'm within a degree of my desired mash temp. Now, if I'm going to miss my mash temperature, I like to miss it low and then ramp up rather than miss as high as I did and then have to wait for it to uh, settle down. But no stress brewing. It is what it is. Uh, now I'm going to stir the top third of the mash during that wait period. The grain bed kind of settled and I don't want to disturb the bottom half so I'm going to stir the top a little bit. This is the uh, the recirculation diffusion plate or whatever they call it. I'm going to put my lid on. You know what? I'm not going to thread it through the handle. Uh, by the way, I've got this is a uh, little clamp to restrict the flow so you get a nice slow flow in your recirculation. Now I have to plug in the pump. All right, I'm going to open the valve to prime the pump. Start the pump. And uh, I've used this clamp to restrict the flow. I kind of like that. Um, I should measure. <laughs> it's supposed to be one liter per minute, but that looks pretty slow to me. I'm going to live with that. All right. Just a couple of clamps to snug it down. And start my brew day timer. All right, there is an issue with the Anvil Foundry, both the 6.5 and the 10.5, uh, that I've read about in all the forums, and that is that there is a space between the outer kettle walls and the inner walls of the mash basket, and in this dead space, the water, because of pressure differences uh, between the top and the bottom and the pump pulling from the bottom, the pressure differences between the water up on the top and the water on the bottom and the pump pulling from the bottom creates uh, this dead space where the water on the sides between the two kettles does not get pulled into the pump and then recirculated. Uh, because of that, you've got water that is not coming into contact with the grains. So the solution is to gently lift the basket, that water on the side, will then get mixed with the rest of the mash water. And according to the experts on the forums, doing so will raise the efficiency 
uh, of your mash. Now I'll do this once more, at least once more, uh, during the course of the mash. Alright, so at the end of an hour, I raised the uh, set temperature up to 168 to do a mash out. And once it reached 168, I held it there for about 10 minutes, and now the tricky part, lifting up the mash basket. Eventually I hope to mount a pulley somewhere up here to help, but I don't have it set up yet. So I'm going to see if I can lift this myself. Hot, hot, hot. That is heavy. You know what? Turn that off. Don't. Okay, so that was a fail. Here's take two. This is not the ideal setup. I hope to have a more centered um, pulling point, not a pulley. But I am going to try this. See if it works. I put a, uh, a hook in the floor joist. Not the ideal thing to do, probably. But let me turn this around. All right, crossing my fingers. Shall we begin? I just changed the, uh, the temperature, the set temperature, to 212. It automatically goes to boil from there. for a post mash gravity of 1053 and what I've got is 1060 well, that doesn't uh, help getting a little piece of fuzz on there Yeah, 1060 is my post mash, and 1060 is what I was hoping to get uh, post boil. So uh, this is going to be a stronger beer than I anticipated. I ain't complaining. Now another thing that I want to check at this point is my pre-boil volume. I'm supposed to be at just a skosh over six and a half gallons, and I see the seven. I don't see the six. It appears that I'm somewhere between six and seven gallons, close to six and a half, maybe a little more. So it looks like I'm spot on. 
Here's a money saving tip. All right, here is something new. I've never done this before, but I read about it recently. Sounded like a good idea. This is a keg that kicked in my kegerator, and it's been sitting there. These back here are also empty, but they still have CO2 in them. So, here is my clean and sanitized keg. I'm going to fill uh, as soon as this fermentation is done. It's about half full of a star sand sanitizing solution and I've got a, a hose connected to the beer line out just stuck in a bucket there. The um, star sand that comes out will be clean. I can use that for other things. And I'm going to use a jumper between this keg and this keg and lo and behold the CO2 is pushing the star sand out. And if I don't have enough in this keg, I've got some more over here. But when this is purged of the star sand, it will be full of CO2 and I'm not wasting anything. I'll do a closed transfer of the beer from my fermenter into this keg. So again, no oxygen is going to get in here and uh, I'm not wasting as much CO2. There's your pro tip. All right, so the boil has started. I was going to show you uh, what FirmCap S does to uh, the boil, but uh, you've seen it before, and it's not that vigorous of a boil with uh, 110 power. Uh, I'll zoom in here and let you see what it looks like. All right, using 110 house current, this is the boil, such as it is, but it is moving, and that's what counts. So now that the boil is going, I'm going to put in my uh, hop additions. I've increased the uh, that one and a half ounce, sixty minute addition to two full ounces because the. Uh, the, uh, the alcohol content is going to be higher than I, I planned, so I want to counteract that with a little more bitterness. Oops, I want my clamp to hold this. Alright, 60 minute boil has begun. Next edition in 45 minutes. Alright, a little tip that I read somewhere is to use a uh, a grease splatter screen over top of your your boil kettle when using 110. Uh, it's porous enough to let some steam out, they say, but also kind of holds a little bit of heat in uh, to help out this anemic boil. So I've got 15 minutes left in my boil, and it's time to add my chiller. Now, to um, to prevent adding a cold chiller into this uh, boil kettle and knocking the boil down, as always happens, um, I put this in the sink and I've been running hot water, as hot as I can get, through the chiller. And it's still going to knock the boil down a little bit, but um, not as much as if it went in cold. So there's that, and there's Horflock. This will help. Uh, Clarify the wart a little bit. Just gonna break this up. All right. Next step, uh, with five minutes left in the boil, will be my final addition of amarillo hops and a little bit of yeast nutrient. Time to add. Final hop addition. That goes in for five minutes. And uh, a little bit of yeast nutrient. That looks good right there. And the brew day timer uh, continues for the last five minutes.
All right. The boil is over. So we turn off the heating element. I'm going to remove the hops from the kettle. And uh, this is where I would chill normally, but I've got to start cooking supper. I'll, uh, I'll come back and chill this in about half an hour. All right, everything's in the fermenter. Uh, I'm doing a gravity check here to see what I'm starting with. And I've got 1067. 1067, um, and I started with 1060. I probably would have had a little higher gravity if I was brewing on the uh, garage system, but using 110 house current, the boil wasn't uh, vigorous at all. It was, it was barely a boil, in my opinion. So I only boiled off, what, half a gallon, if that? So that makes sense that I didn't um, raise the gravity that much during the boil. Okay. Now, pitching the yeast. I got this for free from my favorite homebrew store, uh, Hop Craft Supply Company in Saginaw, Michigan. Look them up online. Uh, this is uh, Lalamond Verdant IPA. Couldn't even find it in the Beersmith Library. It must be fairly new. Um, it's part of the Lal Brew Premium Series, so I had to look up the data sheet online and enter it myself in the brew, uh, beer smith. And I'm just going to pitch this direct, and this is all I'm going to pitch, because it's all I've got. There we go. Yeast pitched. One more thing. Um, maybe I should use my tilt. If it's charged. Yeah, I think it is. Let's put the tilt hydrometer in there. And I'm using the dome lid from my Chronicle. I'm not using the Chronicle fermenter because uh, the smooth sides of the bucket allow me to put a, a firm wrap a heating pad on there. The uh, Chronicle has legs that go up the side and the firm wrap doesn't cling tight to the body of the fermenter. So fortunately the lids are interchangeable for both units. A hey, big shout out to Jim Gleason. Jim uh, owns and operates Radio Wasteland Records in Midland, Michigan. But before that, he was a professor at uh, Delta College in the broadcast department. That's where I met him helping some students uh, with a film project that they were doing. And recently, I reached out to Jim and asked him uh, about organizing my shots to make my editing easier. And he suggested uh, keeping a shot list. It uh, lists all the shots, all the takes, uh, names the scene, and is going to be a big help in getting organized during editing. Thanks, Jim. Cold beer. <laughs>